Okay. Call to order the City Council work session for City of East Grand Forks for Tuesday, February 27th. It is now 5 o'clock. Would the City Clerk please call roll? Mayor Steve Gander? Here. Council President Mark Olstead? Here. Council Vice President Chad Grassel? Here. Council Members Clarence Vetter? Mike Pakshavinsky? Here. Tim Riapel? Here. Henry Tweeton? Here. Mark Demers? Present. Does term quorum. Number one is discussion on the cell tower. Ms. Ellis? I'm just going to uh, cede my time to the uh, consultant, Garrett Lisak, uh, with OWL Engineering. Uh, he's prepared a report. It should be in your packet, and he'll go through that, uh, answer any questions that you have, and then um, there's an email included from the city attorney then as to um, where we move from here. So um, thank you, President Olstead and City Council. I'll turn this over to Mr. Lisak. Mr. Lice. How would you pronounce it? Gary. Gary. That makes it really easy. I'll turn it over to Gary. <laughs> it's on. Okay. I think the best way to approach this, I'll, I'll go through the executive summary, and that basically makes it pretty simple. Um, in my report, I basically structure the report to uh, answer any questions that a, a citizen would ask at a public meeting. And the first thing I do is I, I take the approach of uh, making sure that the application meets all of the federal guidelines, meaning, number one, did they need it where it is? Does it uh, satisfy the requirements of the city for zoning, structural integrity, uh, any nearby towers that could be used instead of this location, uh, health, health standards? Uh, and I did ask, answer some additional questions as far as um, uh, uh, property values. I went through a discussion of property values, and I went through a, a discussion of what the application, uh, some of their exhibits, what they mean. They, they came in with a, uh, a study showing eight or nine different colors and what they basically mean. But basically, I went through all of that, identified the tower where it's positioned or proposed does fit the requirements. Uh, basically, it does fulfill the requirement of they need to think for coverage and capacity there. So I went through that. Uh, I went through the, uh, the interference thing where I made an assumption that uh, even though it's not proposed, I made an assumption that the city, county, radio systems would be on that tower. And I made sure that there was no interference, just in case. There's no interference to either uh, uh, city, county, state frequencies on that tower. I also look at interference to homeowners, television, uh, telephone, that kind of stuff. I didn't see any problem. Uh, the one problem I did find was the proposal of 65 feet uh, the city ordinance requires that there be two additional tower uh, users on the tower, but in my experience, a 65-foot tower would not accommodate usable users on that tower. To make that happen, I would recommend either one of two things. Either you increase the height to 20, 20 more feet, and that way that would accommodate at least two other users on that tower. Now, the city can decide not to uh, require that two more users be on it. But in my opinion, if you do that, you're going to have more towers in that vicinity because somebody's going to want to put a tower up. But with the city ordinance being the way it is, you could force the users to at least locate on that uh, proposed tower. And structurally, the tower can handle uh, additional users. So maybe the best thing to do is open up for questions if you have any questions about the report or anything. Just uh, let's do that. That'd probably be a lot easier. Somebody from the council have any questions regarding the study? Um, as you identified from an engineering standpoint, the, the benefit of having a tower at that particular site, did your study also include 
that a similar benefit would be experienced if it were anywhere inside of this envelope or didn't you go to that extent? Well, the, here, here's the problem. The problem is when, when, I look, when I do analysis on a application, the problem comes in is I can only look at existing towers because if you start playing that what if game of where could it locate, the problem from a city perspective is uh, unless you have control of the location where to put it, you can't tell the applicant where to go. And that's where the problem comes in. It becomes a situation of a big chessboard. So I just pay, basically look at the application and then look at what is existing already, uh, whether it be an existing tower or city property. Can that be used? Because so your, your analysis would not show that they could get similar benefit anywhere inside this circle? You wouldn't come up with anything like that? Well, you make an assumption. In that circle, they could, but the problem comes in is uh, the applicant looked at what? what I saw is a couple of different locations, and the problem comes in is you could find a, a number of places to locate, but then they'd have to go out and get a lease and get approval, yep. and uh, it gets to be it gets to be complicated. Yep. So I have to look at, like I said, what they applied for. Okay, thank you. Mr. Demers. Thank you. And this will be along a similar question, but maybe more specific. Um, so this analysis, this application exhibit that you have in the report, you say it has to have existing towers, but there's a tower at 20th and 3rd that isn't represented in this. Is there a reason, and it's a cell tower, I mean, it's sending cell signal out, but it's not in this report. It hasn't been in any report we've ever seen, and I don't know why. And maybe it's maybe it's not a cell tower, but everybody that I've talked to says it's a cell, cell tower. It's a cell tower. It's right across right. from and my house. We're, we're on the list, I gave a list of towers that I looked at. <coughs> there are 10 towers there. Can you identify which tower that is? Where is that? It's on figure four, being the back. is the one north of town, one of them is the one in Industrial Park, and I guess I don't know if the other one... One was terminated. No, no it's not. It's constructed or dismantled. Yeah, terminated. No, that's right. Dismantled one. Yeah. So, there's only two that are in this study. Um, so there's only two that are in this study, which are the one in Industrial Park, which is the green air, the green circle on the right side of the thing, and then those one north of town, which is the green circle at the top of the picture, and then there's one in Grand Forks over by the by the fairgrounds, which is the green circle in the left side of the circle or of the picture, but in the middle of the picture, not represented, is a cell tower at 20th Avenue and or 20th Street and Third Avenue. And like I said, it, it was one of the questions I had before, and I'm just wondering why either they're using it and it isn't doing what they need it to do, or it's being used at a different, or maybe it's got the maximum number of leaseholders, but I guess I would like it accounted for in some way. Because <laughs> if, you, if you're using this as evidence that there's a need, to me, this isn't putting another pole. It doesn't. It gets at the points that you're saying. No, is I, if we don't control it, we don't want to go and put this issue on some other backyards or whatever. But if there's already a pole there. 
why why are we going and doing this? And obviously, like you said, you have to deal with what the... Yeah, uh, I guess the, the, what I did was I looked at... See, when I do my, my study, I, I start out with a, with a clean sheet of paper. I don't, I don't consider... Uh, I do a search and it says where are the towers that are existing already because I'm looking at the approach of if, it, if there's an existing tower there, they have to at least demonstrate that they can either use it or not use it. And when I went through the list, there are none of the towers that came back are within the search area that the provider has to be in to accommodate either it's too close to an existing tower that they're using because they, they can't go on a tower if it's too close to an, one of their existing towers. But this one is like right smack dab in that light, that cyan color, right in the middle of that. It's east of, I mean, maybe it's too close to the other one, but it's, it's certainly no closer than the north, the one north of town is to the, the proposed one. And if they're supposed to demonstrate that they, they've right. looked at that, I guess that would be something that we should look at. Is and maybe and I I certainly <laughs> reserve the right to be wrong on what the purpose and and what that tower could be used for. But I've, I think I've asked probably five times about it, and <clears throat> nobody has gotten back to me and said, no, this is absolutely not a use. It's been, well, we can't look at that, or we can't do this, or that isn't it. It's part of the application, or it is this. So, I mean, to me, there's just a, there's something that hasn't been looked at. No, the, the problem is, uh, it's, it's either, I'm looking at where it is, and it would be too close to an existing, uh, existing T-Mobile location. Here's the problem. The problem is, uh, if they could have located on the existing structure, they would have. But the problem comes in is that is too close to an existing T-Mobile site. There's a site there to the south and and east of what you're talking about. It's no closer than what they're proposing is to the northern, it, the northernmost tower. And that northernmost tower has got more juice going to it than any of them. Uh, unfortunately, where they're where they're putting it in, it's not closer because it's closer to an existing T-Mobile site. You're talking about the one that's in down to, or in Industrial Park. Is that Industrial Park? Yes, there's an existing T-Mobile site there. Yeah, that's about a half a mile away, and it's about or three quarters of a mile, and it's about three quarters of a mile from their proposed site to the, the north tower. The, pro the, the problem is they already have a site there, and if they were to put the site where you're recommending, it, it would cause it, it's interference. It, it wouldn't work. See, the, the, the problem comes in is that uh, when they propose a site, they have to look at their existing sites where they are already. And we're talking about Verizon, right? Not T-Mobile? We're talking about... Verizon's the one putting it down. Yeah, Verizon. Okay. Just so I'm not okay. thinking... The problem is Verizon has to look at their existing site. And the first thing they look at is where they have one already. But this map that you have in your thing doesn't show that they're broadcasting or accepting any information from them, that current location. It just shows, it shows that they're, broad, or they're using the one in Grand Forks, it shows they're using the one north of town and they're using the one in Industrial Park. It has nothing, there's a big dead area over where this existing tower is yeah. in, the, in the report. Yeah, that, that is because one thing, on, what I did in my report was, if you, if you look at their application exhibit, the there is a there's a, there is an opening where they don't get they get poor coverage. Right, the cyan okay. color. In, in my thing, I I what I look at is 
where they proposed it, and I basically bring all the, because in their coverage, they have five different colors. What I do is I try to make it simple. <laughs> I bring it down to put the coverage in, and then what I simply do is remove them from the analysis. I want to see a hole in the coverage, okay? And the first thing that I noticed is there's a hole in the coverage. Right. It's okay. right over the tower, the existing tower. There's, there's a hole. They're there. not using. Okay. But they can't use that existing place that you are calling out because it's closer to an existing Verizon site. They can't use it because it would cause interference in their system. Okay. Right. But they're proposing a site that is equally distant from one of their towers as this one is to that other one. And I get that you can't have these things, but if we're talking, and if it's because there's a different carrier on them, our ordinance and our, our rules say that you have to allow for co-location to minimize these things. If that's the case, if we're all of a sudden talking about now if there's other users using it, no, what's the purpose of having a co-location, you know, clause in our in our stuff? I guess we can talk about this. All, all I've gotten from anybody I've asked about this is a denial that we need to even look at it. So I'm going to be a, z a no vote to put this up until I get at least someone willing to answer the question. So I'm going I'm to restate you. what I just said. The problem is they cannot locate there because there's an existing site that they're using already. And, and they can't, it's interference. It would cause interference to their existing system. Uh, I, don't, I don't know how else to explain it. I mean, because there's a tower there, the problem comes in is it's, it's, it's too close to an existing Verizon site. It's the one that's on Grand, I think it is. Well, they're calling it Grand. In my report, they called it Grand. That's what I use. If they're using a site, wouldn't it have, wouldn't it be showing that yeah. they have good signal at that site? This is the one he's looking at. This is the map he made. If you go directly across, this red line here is 220. So I drew one just off of that. So what he's saying is this one would be in direct interference with that. Right, and when you look at the new proposed site, it's equal, pretty roughly equal distant from that north tower as this one is from that. So if that one is interference, then the and other I, one would I be interference as well. That. So I can't explain that. That's what he's here for. Yeah, so I guess if it would be your questioning to the consultant. So he could always review it and come back. So Mark, and one thing is, <coughs> excuse me, the center lines at those towers are very different. The ones to the north are very tall, so their signals up higher. And I believe those antennas are running a different technology, uh, more voice coverage than data coverage, which is a much different signal um, that they're operating from. So you may not get interference to the north because that tower, those antennas are stuck at a higher center line operating on a different frequency than the tower at Grand where it's shorter and it's uh, more data coverage. I mean, the, the, the problem is, here, here's the problem that, that, that everybody has. When you do a coverage study, there are probably five or six different frequencies that are being used by these providers. And uh, when, you, when you do a coverage map, you have to come up with some kind of compromise to do coverage, yes or no. So when I did my coverage study, when it says new there, I'm, I'm considering that's that the, the one that's at grand already. I'm considering it. But they're calling, what I'm calling grand is what they gave me as their existing site. These are all their existing sites. Yes. So the one over by me is not an existing site of theirs. It's someone else's site. 
yes. they can't go on that site? Well, because it's too close to their existing site at Grand. That's the problem. Yeah, but this new one's right almost the same distance. Yeah. To Dagwood and EGF. Yeah. But I guess my, the point I'm trying to make is I understand the need for technology. There's probably no one here that wants more data technology, more data infrastructure than me. But I think our first priority is to make sure that we do make it as small of an impact as possible. And to me, the first option is to look at existing polls. And to this point, I haven't seen anything. It, we keep getting this thing where it's it's never listed. It's never even an option. And to me, that that's an omission. So, like I said, I get what you're trying to say. I disagree with your where we're at, and I've already stated my position. Thank you. Do we, in fact, know that this is a working tower? Do you know that the one on 3rd and 20th is a working tower? Well, I know it's a tower. So I know <laughs> if it isn't used as cell phone, I mean, it could be. I would imagine me, it's it, as easy to put an antenna on a already there tower as it is to put a te an antenna on a newly constructed tower. So I know the tower is there. So because he pulled all the towers and. Well, that's my point, is if they're not using it, yeah. well, that's. Yeah, but I'm trying to save them money anyway. I mean, why are we doing this if I'm looking at the there's already a tower available? So when I was first issued the search ring years ago, the first thing I did was identify the existing towers. Um, so I showed the Verizon RF the tower to the north and that tower to the east. I believe it may have at that time been by Comcast or something. Um, they said we're already on the tower to the north and the tower to the east can't meet their coverage gap. It's over a mile from where we're proposing. And for this data tower, we need to be right in the heart of the core coverage to get the data signal where it needs to be. So when it's sent to RF, we're over a mile away from the search area. I disagree. Henry. <clears throat> I'd like to make a comment. Uh, the city, as part of its policy, is looking towards forcing the development in the north end to go east. It saves us money because if if we c would continue to go north, we'd have to have an additional fire department. It would change the police department. It would take more policemen. It, it's not economical. Now here's what we've got going here. It's, it's like these roundabouts. The worst thing that you can do is to put a roundabout into a, uh, an area. And do you have anything on, the, <coughs> do anything on the cell tower, sir? And, and I disagree with one thing you say in page 9, that uh, there's no credibility that affects property values. I practiced law for over 40 years. Location and what's near it does determine property value. Our city attorney can tell you. We've got an attorney here in East Grand Forks that has attended other meetings. Uh, it, there's an old saying in the business world, if you've never heard of it, location, location, location. Now, the problem is Verizon comes in here the last minute and when you get a built-up community. Why don't they get ahead of the thing? Uh, <coughs> next, next meeting, uh, our neighbors up there should be invited. They should have been invited to this meeting. But they, they I'm were against what you're saying. I don't care what the results you come yeah. up with. Henry, let's clear that right now. Yeah. The, the letter, right, the letter was it. mailed on Friday afternoon. I was in Minneapolis attending a seminar. I left Thursday afternoon. I Friday. You come in. Yeah, I sorry about that. You want to look at my letter? It was postmarked Friday. This, this report is dated February 1st, three weeks later. I sent out the report when I received it. I also sent out the letter when I received the final report. 
I did the letters on Thursday. I sent them out. I did not do this in intention to not invite anyone. This is not a public hearing. This is just a review of the report and there still will be time to discuss it. But to state that I didn't notify anyone or that I purposely held anything or didn't notify you in time is incorrect. That's why we don't have a neighborhood here. Nobody could, nobody could change their schedule to be here. So sorry I'm, about my interruption. That is a little pet peeve of mine. That's really ambush. <clears throat> I had, I was, I was gone to Minneapolis until 9:30 last night. I had a little bit of time to look at the report, not to analyze it or even try to study. Okay. I do have questions, and I'm sorry to interrupt. So, and, and there will be a public hearing coming up. Yeah, that was my next thing. It's, I have a question for you, but I, I'm sure. clarify something with Mr. Galstead. What his comments and his email that at this time moving forward there would be another public hearing so people could come to speak and that would be notified to everybody how many days in advance. It would be what uh, we require a 10 day notification would be 14 typically. Yes. And so what happens is because the paper only runs once a week, right. it goes a minimum of 12 days before the public hearing. And I typically send the letters out the same day as the publication of the public hearing. I just want to make sure that everybody knew that. So I just want to clarify one thing here too, is that this was a report to be given to the council and to explain to the council. So, um, this would be on a normal agenda. This is not a public hearing. No, no requirement was made for sending out notices to the public for this. This was done as a courtesy to make sure that we were as open as possible. We did it as soon as we, as soon as we could. So um, we, they said this was not a requirement. We sent this out as a courtesy to the neighbors. Okay. I'm um, just, just along the line. Sorry, Mr. President. Um, what we have is basically a report that that got to the bottom of the question, is there a coverage gap? And does this tower, the proposed tower, fill that gap? It's kind of what we, what we came down to. We didn't propose alternative sites. We didn't say, what if this, that, or the other. This question was, is there a gap? And does the proposed tower fill the gap? It's kind of what it came down to. And, and the answer is yes. Because when you, when you look at Example, when you look at what Verizon submitted, uh, it's kind of hard to read, okay? So what I normally do is I distill all that information and I basically do a coverage study on what they're proposing. And I then I just simply remove what they're proposing and I want to see a hole in the, in the coverage. It eliminates all these other questions of move it here, move it there, move it there, move it there, because it gets to be uh, exponentially difficult to do that because of the technology and the frequencies and all those other things. So when you look at figure five, I have put in what they proposed. Then I simply remove it. Yep, on six. And there's a hole in the coverage. So they satisfy that. Criterion. That that criteria, um, but it gets it gets even more complicated because what what Verizon is, is asking for is also a capacity issue, and capacity is very very difficult to analyze because, uh, example, if you have a neighborhood that's streaming video at six o'clock at night with Netflix, okay. That has nothing to do with coverage, because what happens with these sites is, um, imagine a, a, a hose, and when the capacity gets full, what you basically wind up doing is having to restrict the water flow. Because like example, AT&T, Verizon, Sprint, when, when their bandwidth, when that site gets full, they're gonna have to start doing what they call bandwidth limiting limit the stream so that people can make phone calls and all that other stuff because uh, a lot of the providers what they'll do is uh, when they get a 911 call that takes priority over somebody streaming Netflix okay that takes priority when public safety uses it that takes priority so those are kind of issues that come into the the equation that are that are hard to put into a report because uh, 
what numbers do you have? The site isn't built. Yep. And I know there's an <clears throat> argument that by adding that tower, by adding that capacity, everybody on this whole circle arguably would see a better experience because right now it's all probably getting drawn down into that hole. You fill the hole and arguably at times these all could see a little better service. Yeah, well, because, you know, uh, the capacity thing has nothing to do with coverage. Correct. Okay. But it's all about the flow. Right. Because what happens is um, how, how these systems work is uh, it's, like a, it's like a honeycomb arrangement. Okay. And what happens is when you're driving down the street in your car, now it's walking down the street. When you're driving your car down the road, your, your cell phone is picking up a signal from a carrier, uh, uh, from a tower. It determines which cell they want to go to. And what happens is as you're driving along, your, your signal is doing two things. It's getting weaker from the cell, and it, to compensate for that, it's increasing the power output of your cell phone to compensate for that. And the minute the numbers start changing, what it does is it hands off the signal to a different cell. So to, to answer your, your concern is when you're driving around this area, these cells all talk to each other, and they're going to determine which cell is the best cell to use. And you complicate the matter by now putting data on, like for movies and whatever else these children are using it for, texting, movies, whatever. Uh, that's what makes it even more difficult because you just can't say coverage is the a prime directive. It's also the minute you start adding capacity, you start helping these other cells around because they're going to offload things to each one of these cells depending on who's using it, how they're using it, what they're using it for. And unfortunately, uh, to follow up for your question and your question, I contacted five different consulting groups explained to them what we were looking for. The only thing the consulting groups would look for was the application specific. They said we cannot tell them that they have to look at another tower site or look at the location as a whole unless the city was willing to pay for that study on their own where there are gaps. But then they're looking at every different communication and then we're telling them where they should be locating and, and from their legal standpoint, they did not want to be responsible for telling a uh, carrier where they need to locate. Um, so they all stated one thing. We will look at the application specific to the tower and whether or not it's necessary and explain the reasons why. And that's all that they can do. So unless we want to pay for something more, and even at that point, we can't specify where each carrier needs to go. So that's kind of what they explained to me. Now, why they didn't look at 3rd and 20th is probably simply for that reason. They can't tell them that they can't build a new tower. They have to locate on a different tower. Well, it's because when they pull up their list, it doesn't show up. So they and start from a, a spot of right. lack of knowledge. So, and, But so that may so also be a reason why they can't locate there is... If it's not showing up, maybe there's a spe specific reason why they didn't locate there to begin with. There, there is a reason for that, uh, and I'll, I'll explain to you. The problem comes in, you look at the list I provided, this list also includes canceled, dismantled, because a lot of the carriers, when they go to build a tower, will register the tower with the FCC, which then puts it in this database. And if, uh, example, a grain elevator wouldn't be on this list but there are grain elevators that are 100 feet tall, okay? Um, but lately, these cell carriers, if they're putting up a tower, even if it's 65 feet, will register the tower. Maybe it's not registered. Well, it doesn't have to be under 200 feet. So that's the next problem. That's probably what it is. Uh, and then, uh, I don't know what the provider looked at. Maybe this tower is not structurally capable of handling the equipment. It's like when, what? When these guys go out and do a, when these gentlemen go out and do a site search, um, they're restricted. They first start off with a circle called their, their search ring where the RF people sell, tell them where they would like to locate for the optimum performance of their system. 
uh, they're not throwing darts at a dartboard and saying, I, I think I want to locate in Grand Forks over here. They have an area they have to look at to, to, to satisfy the, the radio people. Then these guys go out and then look at the property that's available. They will look at, generally speaking, they'll look at city property first, then they'll look at uh, existing towers. They will drive around the area in addition to picking up the FCC list of towers. So they just don't, they don't stop. And I've seen situations where they have 10 towers in an area, but nobody's willing to give them a lease. So now you have the next problem. When you come up to a city and I say, here's the tower what we got, they say, why don't we go over this tower? Well, maybe that tower guy doesn't want to give them a lease. So you have to have a willing person I want to give them a lease, a tower there, or a structure there. So it gets, it gets fairly complicated. So that's why when you talk to other consultants, um, they're bound because, uh, according to uh, all the statues, they can't start looking at other places to go because unless the city has control of that property, they can't tell the provider, well, why don't you try over here or try over there? Um, but what I did do is I did look at this list, and I did look at is it possible to locate on these towers because your ordinance says if there's an existing structure that will accommodate them and it fits their needs, they have to try there first, also city property or city structures. So I, I did look at that, and I eliminated all of these towers that are on this list from the mix, so I, I did look at them. If there's another tower that's there, uh, you know, I didn't drive around and look at all the towers in the area. I, I, I wish I could, but I, I just can't do that. So I have to look at what's provided uh, to me, either by the provider or the city. But like I said, I start with a fresh sheet of paper. I, I do a search on these towers to find out what's available, and I go through the list in a, in a very methodical way because I try to make it so the city doesn't have to go through these uh, what-if scenarios because I try to eliminate that from the mix. And it gets to be uh, usually extremely complicated because everybody has a, a new, fresh idea. But unfortunately, there's a legal problem with that. Any other council members have any questions on this? Mr. Gassel. So in this day and age with technology the way it is, is there a different form that of the way this coverage can be placed in this area? Or does it have to be a tower? I mean, does it have to be a tower? Can it be, can you put multiple spots through this area on street lights on well that's coming it's called small cell technology but the problem there is um, uh, at this state of the game they're locating the small cells to fill a, a very specific need they only have a range of about 500 to a thousand feet example if you had a uh, a business that was on a uh, a manufacturing business didn't have, let's say, didn't have uh, fiber optics going to it or that thing. They would put a small cell in to accommodate that user. And example, I did a, I did a job uh, for Gustavus University, where they mounted small cells, nine of them, on light poles. But guess where they put them? Dormit near dormitories, libraries, because they have a very specific window they're looking at where they had a lot of people, a, a lot of traffic. Uh, in a very small area, and it does accommodate. But the trouble comes in, you're right, you're going to get more poles. They're going to be lower. So right now, we're, uh, the state just passed the, I think it's a 50-foot rule on the right-of-way for small cells. That's coming. But, uh, you know, years ago, people would say, we're not going to have cell phones in the future, we're going to have satellites. That was 20 years ago. Guess what? We still have cell phones, <laughs> we haven't got satellites. But, you know, it's going to happen. And what's happening over the last, let's say, 20 years, what's happened is, you know, when, when cell phones first came out, they had 300-foot towers spaced five, six miles apart. You had some right here in Grand Forks. 
Okay, but now what do you got? Now I'm only I'm, I'm seeing cities that are proposing under 100 feet, and a lot of them are like 50, 60 footers, because they're they're satisfying a very small area. Because now we're we're, we're we've got coverage now, but we don't have capacity. That's the problem. In your in your situation, when I looked at the coverage maps, you have a coverage problem. Uh, when I looked at Verizon, their national map. They only claim 70% of Grand Forks covered, East Grand Forks covered. That's uh, pretty bad, because usually uh, those marketing maps are over-dramatized. Nobody wants to tell you that you only get 70% coverage. They always go 100, I cover everywhere, 100%. So that told me right away that there is a coverage problem in your area. And you folks who live here, if you have uh, Verizon, do, do you have coverage gaps in your phone? you drive around? Probably so. It depends on the carrier, because you know, gotta remember, this is only one carrier, Verizon. You've got what, six others. You got T Mobile, Sprint, um, is it US Cellular out here yet? I don't know. But you know AT&T. AT and T. So every one of those systems is yeah. different. They have different footprints. So when you look at the map like I gave you on the coverage map, this has nothing to do with AT and T. A lot of the uh, general public will come in and say, I got good coverage on my phone, and I ask them a simple question. Uh, we're talking about Verizon here, okay? And you ask them, oh, who's your provider? When they say AT&T, well, they might have good coverage, but the guy from Sprint or the guy from Verizon might not have the same coverage because all of these systems were designed in a vacuum. They, they had no, nobody helped each other out because they couldn't by law. They had to uh, design every th everything independently, and it, it got to be very complicated. So now what we have now is a mix. Every company is different. They have, example, if at t were to come in with a proposal, their map would look entirely different. And then your question would be, well, we have a Verizon tower. Can't you use that? Well, if they could, they would. But uh, that's the problem you have with, with uh, uh, being outside of the metro area, uh, you're, you're coming up to speed, and now they're filling in their gaps. When you get more people moving in, because, you know, the problem today is these young kids, I say young kids, uh, 25 to 30-year-old kids, don't have wired phones anymore. Everybody has a cell phone. I think it's up to like 50%. Uh, I still have a wired phone in my house. I don't trust cell phones 100% yet. But when you talk to a younger person, they don't have a wired phone in their new house. They all have cell phones. I don't. You know? And that's what's happening. Question I have for you, sir. Uh, on the, the coverage maps, the this one, sir. Okay. Okay. What, how old is this data, and do you have that? Was this given to you, or did you get it off the FCC? Oh, I generated it. You generated it. And, and how old is the, the data that you generated this map with? What is, what is that from? Is that from the week you did it, or is it? Right now. Okay. I mean, it, it, the, no, the data, there's no data here. What I'm using is uh, to terrain data from shuttle terrain data, which is like one meter accuracy on the terrain. And uh, I use the power coming out of the transmitter, and I make an assumption. Uh, the trouble, like I said, was with the number of frequency bands they use, I had to pick uh, a propagation model that makes it so it's readable, because you would have six different coverage uh, mm -hmm. problems. So I just sort of make it general so you can see what the coverage looks like. The data is, that's signal strength on those maps. There's no, no time on it. It's what it is. So... To get the maps, you make the assumption what that power of that tower is. They you tell make me. the assumption of how far that goes out. It's not an assumption. I, I, I calculate. I'm just no, no, it's calculated. Yeah. In other words, if I were to move antennas up, like I move antennas up 10 feet, 20 feet, and I can see the difference in coverage. So it's, it's more like uh, I'm actually predicting what the coverage is going to be. And... Here's what makes it even more difficult. When you add in um, all the frequencies they use, you now make it even more difficult because it all depends on the phone. My phone's $1,000, right? 
that phone is a lot better than a flip phone that costs $65. So when you start putting that in, you say, what's my coverage? The coverage changes from phone to phone, age of the phone, where you put it, is it on your belt, is it in your pocket. All of these variations uh, come into place. I use three feet, like I'm using three feet off the ground as my receive antenna. That's the difference between a six foot guy and a midget, okay? Um, if, you, if you use all those kind of numbers, these things can change. You know, I can, like example, the FCC, when, when they do a measurement of uh, signal coverage, they use a 30 foot antenna. Who the heck has a 30 foot antenna on their cell phone? It sort of really doesn't make any sense. So I, use, I try to use real world numbers to give you uh, an idea of what to expect. These are not generated to give you, it's uh, 110 volts, 112 volts. It's a very general look and I don't change anything from map to map. Once I set up the parameters, I harden them and I don't change them. In other words, if you were to ask me, what would happen if I moved in the antenna up from 60 feet to 120? All I'm changing is the height of one antenna and you would see the coverage change on that one cell, okay? And I try to keep it that way so I don't get bogged down into uh, what kind of phone, uh, you know. All I take into consideration is the terrain. And, and it gets even more complicated because um, with these new frequency bands that they're use, using, uh, foliage now enters the equation. If you have a wooded area, the coverage changes from summer to winter. And in winter, there's no leaves on the trees, so therefore uh, it propagates like a screen door right through it. But in the spring and the summertime, you get leaves with water in them, and that absorbs RF energy, and you get less coverage. So you add that to the mix, and it gets even more complicated. So. I try to give a, a, a very generalized picture to eliminate all of those anomalies that make things just very confusing. So you're looking at this in having the new coverage, coverage here, then good coverage on this map. There's no actual study done as you in this area testing that if there's data or coverage. You're not standing there. Oh, no, 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 no. Yeah, you're correct. But, but, but see, I will tell you, um, I have done similar studies, let's say FM radio stations, where I have predicted coverage and I have actually gone to the site and measured it and I was within a couple percentage. I mean, these propagation, propagation models are pretty darn accurate. Uh, this is not rocket science. It's, it's pretty good. But again, don't try to view this as... Um, you know, like I'm saying, an absolute value of 10 volts, 20 volts, 30 volts, you know. It's, it's more of a general thing to give you an idea. What I try to do is I try to give you indoor coverage, in-building coverage with the orange and the, uh, the bluish one being outside because that's what we're looking for. Because uh, in a building, example, when, you, when you're outside, uh, you get one coverage. You, you jump into your tuna fish can, and guess what happens? You lose coverage, okay? Uh, when you go into your house, depends. If you have uh, aluminum siding on your house or if you have uh, uh, insulation with aluminum on it, guess what happens? You'll notice that your cell phone gets less coverage. Uh, you go by a window, it changes. So all of these variables, uh, you don't notice, but they're there. Uh, we're just we're just immune to them because we don't pay attention to it. But all of those variables c can come into play in this kind of analysis. And it, when you start doing that, uh, it gets really complicated, and uh, uh, it gets to be a PhD exercise when you start doing this. Uh, you can even do things like wall thickness and figure out what's going to happen through a wall. Um, if you if I was doing a, a like a paging system for a fire department, I would be concerned about a fireman being down in the basement of a house or of a, a factory. What's the signal going to be down in there? But this kind of analysis, you're just concerned about, do I have coverage or don't I have coverage? And it, it, that was the intent of the, of the study. I, you know, I try to make it simple. And it gets, mm. it gets fuzzy really fast. 
So basically, the the request that came forth last year, it, it, correct me if I'm wrong, is due to increase in data data need, correct? Just data need, not voice, that but data, a, right? I believe so. Yes. Yep. It's for data. It's capacity. It's to offload the surrounding sites to make sure they're operating where they need to. Um, so it's not only increasing the capacity in the general area, but it's going to offload the surrounding towers and make their signal stronger as well. So. What in this area where it's proposed, what study or ha was the whoever is doing the analysis, were they actually in this area when for Verizon testing the data usage and if data was needed? Uh, they use their propagation system um, in office. The RF engineers do not travel to the field for that. They use their <coughs> Also, to help you out, each one of these sites, um, it's not like uh, in the old days where you would drop phone calls and you would know what would happen. You call up the cell company and say, why, why, am I, why am I losing dropping phone calls? Well, today, uh, these sites are very, very automated to the fact that uh, if a site, uh, as, I, as I've seen in their systems, what happens is these sites collect huge amounts of data. They'll, there's no more voice, by the way. Uh, everything's data. Your voice gets transmitted as data. There's no more voice. So the problem comes in is these sites know how much data is going through them, if they have dropouts, all these issues. And when the systems get an alert, they'll say, this system is getting over capacity. The RF engineers at like Verizon will be alerted to the fact that one of their sites is being attacked to the, to the extreme. Then they're going to go back and look at it and say, what do we do to fix the problem? Can it be repositioning the antennas, moving them up, moving them down, do whatever they got to do? The, their last course of action is put another site in because it's expensive. They would much rather change antennas, reposition things to satisfy the need. But in this case, they have, uh, they have a coverage problem to begin with, number one. But uh, even more important, they, have, they do have a capacity problem. Mr. Demers. Thank you. Uh, is there a fiber line that will be going to this site? Um, that's something that the Verizon Transport team um, would work on directly with the fiber companies. They send out an information, all the fiber companies in the area. Well, how are you working on bandwidth if you're not working on that? I mean, every every fiber here goes through the same yep, so switch, so, area, so you're really not forward. affecting bandwidth if you're just adding one more fiber line to the same switch. I guess I'm not understanding the question. Well, all the fiber lines all go through the same spot. I mean... So it's not like you're running a whole new pipe all the way to the internet. <laughs> it's it's going to the same switch. I'm I'm assuming. So question is where's that's the, the bottleneck? That's is the, the bottleneck. Fiber it's or not is it the cell tower. Where's the bottleneck? You don't store the information on that line between that and the next and the switch. That it's fiber doesn't store information. So what are you adding another trunk line somewhere to get? This new capacity or this new yeah, that's bandwidth? That's my area of expertise, so I don't want to. Okay. Do so any other council members have any questions? I know that Mr. Neal, do you have any questions on the study at all? Well, regarding the study of what's in. Like, like I said before. I know we're going to have an opportunity down the road. Okay. I just want to make sure if you have any questions on the study, sir. I thank you. I, I read it once, and I did not have the opportunity to actually decipher it. I don't have a color photocopier. 99.9% .9 of the work that I have is data at the office, and that's black and white. What is the, just maybe some generic questions. On figure six. Gerard, can you sit up to the microphone? Sure. On, fig on figure six, it says present coverage, and you got a coverage gap. What is the radius of that coverage gap? It's that white area is a coverage gap. What, what, uh, what's the physical dimensions? I didn't put a scale on it. I could if you want, but 
Are we talking 200 feet, 1,000 feet? Oh, no. It's that whole area that's white, is, I consider that a coverage gap. But it means it means nothing to me. I have no idea what your scale is. I don't know if we're looking at 10 miles from the top to the bottom or if we're looking at a half mile. I, I didn't put a scale on it because I didn't think it was needed. I'm just showing a gap in coverage, yes, no. It's a yes, no kind of thing. I mean, I could put a scale, but what, okay. So everything on this page that's white is gap coverage then? Just, and I'm just looking at this area right here. I'm not concerned about outside the circle. So we have no idea coverage gap on this other than just this little that's, circular that's, area that we don't know how big it is. That's all I'm analyzing is the, the effect of that new tower on this coverage area in this system. There are other sites around here, but they don't affect this, this coverage area. Okay. Um, are you aware that the golf course has a significant acreage of property surrounding that site? No. Okay. Did anybody tell you that they have acres and acres and acres surrounding that coverage gap? No. Are you aware that, this, that they have control over uh, probably a half a mile? Uh, probably maybe not a half mile. You're going to go at least three-eighths of a mile north. And going at a diagonal to the northeast and also to the southeast, they probably go at least a half to three quarters of a mile. What, what is the purpose of your question? Purpose of my question is, is that you test. You said earlier that you're only looking at this, just this one little spot, and it was it was difficult, complicated to look at other sites because the applicant only looked at this site here, and you said that getting ownership lease agreements to where you can locate those other towers comes into play. And my purpose of my question is, if you knew that they have a significant amount of area in which a tower could be located to serve the same purpose to have this coverage gap eliminated. I, that's, that was not my mm -mm. duty. Okay. <clears throat> I think that was I, know, I, understand you, I understand your question, yeah. but the only thing he could look at was this site. I, I, and then we and Nancy went over that about talking about the right. other sites, and yep. I just want to make sure. Yep. No, I'm clear. I'm I'm fully aware of that. Okay. Were you also aware that the golf course was proposing another site closer to their building, but planning and zoning for East Grand Forks denied that? I have no idea. Okay. So there was all there were all there is alternative sites on the golf course that could accommodate the tower. Are you you're not aware of that either? I okay. could care less. Okay. Fills that in, doesn't it? Are you can, or can can a provider power down? Can they can they can they can they limit their signal strength? We already know that AT and T and some hey, of the let, other one can slow the can let, slow the speeds down. I, I know you're a lawyer, but I'm going to tell you something right now. If you don't know what you're talking about, and you ask a question, I'll give you an answer. But here's the problem: Did they power down their system? your phone powers down the system. In other words, the closer you get to a cell tower of, of Verizon, it powers down automatically. It communicates because of one thing. They're in the business of conserving batteries in your phone. So the question is, do they power down? Yes, they do. But it depends on each user, where they are in, in, in proximity to the tower. So the, they would love to, the, you know, they're operating a system that uh, is on the same frequency bands, and they have to be careful of interference from one site to another. So they don't, they don't want to use maximum power all the time. They use the minimum power required to compu can complete the communication. So that's how they do it. It's, it's, a, it's a very complex system because if you had your phone at full power all the time, the batteries would go down in a couple of hours. But what they do is they, they limit it so they extend their battery life, they, they, they extend their integrity of their system, and they keep everything uh, the way it is. And that's from a safety perspective because most people, when they use their phone, where do they put it? Next to their head. The, the closer you get to your head, the more power you have, the more uh, RF you have. So that's another safety concern. So they're, they're doing this all the time. It's all part of the system. And uh, 
like I said, when I analyze the system, I have to analyze it from what they have proposed because it gets to be very complicated, very fast, and very expensive. And I, uh, you know, that's just the way it is. I know they had another site because I had plans on the other site closer to. Yeah. Yes, yeah. that was the first one that, right. that you had an application for, I, which I stated that yeah, you're right. not where they're looking. Right, and we this moved it, and I, I started everything over. So he was aware of it, but he wasn't. Well, I didn't analyze it. And I may not understand all your technical stuff, but what I do understand is when I get this and I have maybe a couple hours to take a look at it and not understand it, that's a problem. I can understand it, but what I don't appreciate is, is that you don't or you – what is done is this is it's like a like I said earlier if you want to buy a particular piece of equipment whether it be a lawnmower or it be a payloader you all you have to do is set the specs and you're going to get one manufacturer if you're looking at the coverage gap with the tower just on this one spot to me that is not sufficient you're not doing the city good you're not doing the citizens any good i understand what you're saying gary is that you don't have the ability that that's not what your engagement is and without knowing that there's other places to put it at i think that that's a big problem but if there was a, what was wrong with the, the place that was first suggested to you it was the wrong site it wasn't wasn't on the application. Okay, so if the golf course, like they told us at a private meeting, that they first suggested that spot, would that be a spot that you could look at? If the city directs me to, I could look at it, but the problem you're gonna have is, from a legal perspective, is the applicant has applied for a spot, and this is a spot that the city has to review. If, if you wanna review another spot, that's you can do it all you want, but the problem comes in from a legal perspective of the city is the city has an application. They have to review the application. They cannot start playing what if scenarios because if they do, uh, it could be a legal issue for the city. They also could have a legal issue the way you're doing it. Now, who's the, who's the applicant? Is it the golf course and the city like what's been represented to us at other meetings or is it just Verizon? Have you seen the application? The city has nothing to do with this. The application or, says okay, the take, golf course me, and Valley Verizon. Golf, yes. they say it's owned, the land is owned by the city. There's a, there's a lease agreement between the city and the golf no, course. No, so, mm -hmm. no mm -hmm. not this piece. Mm -hmm. not, no. but, but there's other parts of the golf course that there is. Well, yeah, there's a lot of parts of the town right. that are, but this not, is actually on enough. golf course we're land. Enough. No, but the originally the, what the golf course told us, the board of directors at a meeting, they specifically told us that they asked for a site that was closer out of the area that would not interfere, and they were shot down. We were also told that it was Verizon and the golf course that made a joint application for the cell tower. And you talked about the applicant, and if the applicant is the golf course, I would like to know why, if there was another spot that would have been less intrusive, why wasn't that looked at first? We were specifically told Planning and zoning is the one that next it. They're referring to the one by the new clubhouse. And the argument was um, part of our requirements of the cell tower was that it had to be in the least conspicuous place where there was trees and uh, coverage and that was uh, directly in the middle of an open lot. Um, they applied for this site first. They. Verizon and the Valley Golf Course applied for this site first. They withdrew this application. They submitted a second application in next to the new clubhouse. That was not a location that met our requirements. That was denied. They came back to this application after what Verizon has said was this was the best location for them. That is all that I can accept. So obviously then Verizon has done some studies. They've looked at other locations to come up with some kind of an alternative location other than this one. They, they have. Yeah, and there's been, obviously there'll be other locations as well then. I, I thought that that was one of the things that you were talking about earlier, Gary, that 
if it's in the summer and you have leaves and the water, that's going to interfere. And now if you have a place that's going to be out in the open, you're not going to have that interference year round. Wouldn't that be a better spot? At no. least from that perspective? No, because, you know, this, you have to understand this coverage study you're looking at is not meant to be an engineering thing that says, you know, uh, values to things. It's, it's meant to be a yes, no kind of thing because the city's got to make a determination very simply, is there, a, is there a gap in coverage or isn't there a gap in coverage, okay? The problem now comes in is when a, when a provider comes to a city and says, I need it for capacity, it's very, very difficult to do a study on capacity because in and by itself depends on a lot of other factors. And, you know, the distance that on these maps, it's not important because all we're trying to show is that does it meet the requirements of having a gap in coverage? If there was, if this site didn't provide the coverage, when you put the thing back in, you wouldn't see the white disappear. Okay, this intended is to hook up to these three sites together because to the east of this site, I don't know what it looks like. I don't know if there's any houses there or a lot, you know. The thing you're, you're looking at is the coverage doesn't stop at the end of these uh, little circles because RF keeps going and it, it goes determined, like I said, the phone quality, the terrain, the season. So you can, you might be able to, uh, in, in the summertime, only go a mile from this tower. And the winter, you might be able to go five miles, okay? But, but a company like Verizon can't bet on what the season's gonna be, if it's gonna rain, snow, what the terrain is a mile away. Uh, they have to look at their coverage as it is right now and their system. Uh, I can understand you're, you're trying to, uh, to move it to another site, but as you'll notice and you look at these, you start moving these around, they start getting closer and closer to each other, and then you start interfering with each other, and they're trying to avoid that. That's why the circles are very small, because they're trying to eliminate the potential interference between their existing system. They can't move it any closer because they, they cause interference to themselves, they don't want to do that. But you haven't studied the other towers. The other thing is, is that, have you looked at the elevations? That's part of this, that's part okay. of the. And what, what is, what's, the, what's the elevation differential from where the tower site is to 200 feet away? I have no idea. Wouldn't that, all, isn't the height of the tower also important on your coverage gap? Yeah, and, and I, had, I had a look at what the city, uh, they, they said 65 feet is what this tower's proposed. That's what I analyzed. And in fact, I even recommended the city to go 20 feet higher. Did you look at the, did you drive out there and look at the site to see what vegetation's out there? No. Okay. So you haven't taken that into consideration? I don't have to. Okay. And I also, for a point of clarification, the Planning Commission nor myself can deny a special use permit application. We only make recommendations. Oh, I'm fully aware of that. Okay, so yeah. to state that we denied it is not what we were told. Truthful. What we were told by the golf course, and I'm not making this up, they said that's what they wanted it, and your name specifically was brought up that you're the one that said you can't put it there. I'm not saying it's right, I'm just reporting it firsthand. And they also said that the council wanted this tower, so they lied to you there too. Yeah. So there's two yeah. that they got caught. Yeah. One thing that you could explain for me is if the city, if you are going to have more than one provider on the same tower, you were talking earlier about the interference with each other. Isn't that going to be exaggerated when you're going to be on the same tower? No. It'll work, it'll work on the same tower, but it won't work on different towers no, because a certain period of time? Different providers have different channels, different frequencies. It's an A and a B, uh, but the problem is that Verizon has this A channels. These are all in the same channel band. Another provider like AT&T is on a whole separate classification of bands. Might be the C band. It's a different set of channels. Okay, so then they shouldn't have any interference that you talked about. You said the problem was that the interference of the T-Mobile. 
No, 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 no. Verizon. Verizon. Between Verizon and Verizon, they're on the same channel. So it's this is only looking at Verizon. He's referring to the T-Mobile tower okay. that Verizon's on. Yeah. All right. T so they, the, all they have to do is find another tower. If, if the city requires three providers on one tower and you have a tower that only has one or two providers, that should, look to, should be looked at first, I would think. And, and I've addressed that. I said uh, to, to solve that problem, you have two options. Number one, eliminate the ordinance requirement that they put. No, he's referring to Verizon should have looked at a different sure. tower. Yeah. They did. See, it, was that part of the application? Before, or, did, before, or did you look at that? Before they even uh, apply, look at all these providers, all these providers, and I, I've been doing this for 35 years, these providers are not going to build a tower where they don't need it. If they have a water tower, an existing tower, a building that can accommodate their system, they will use it because they don't want to go through zoning and planning. They can avoid all that by just sticking on the existing tower and, and go for it. So the problem comes in is, you're saying, did they look at it? Before these guys uh, from site acquisition people go out, they're armed with one thing. Here's a search area, the golden circle. They would love to have it in that circle. Their first goal is to find it in that circle. They can't go outside that circle because if they propose a tower a half a mile away, they would get their head handed to them because it doesn't fit. It does not fit the equation. They're not going to put a tower where, it, A, it doesn't work, cause interference on their existing system, and uh, if they can get uh, a willing landowner to give them a lease. That's the problem. You can have a tower all you want. There's not a tower there, but if you can guarantee that they can get a lease and it work, works in their system, they would jump right on it. They're also asking to do it if there's a, if there's another tower available that's owned by another company that has a spot available to it. They will look at that. Oh, absolutely. Right. They you, will build but, their you, own. but you're assuming that because of your 30 years. Did you get any protocol? Did you get any information from Verizon that they in fact did that? They looked at six you different sites. Yes, I do. Okay. They looked at six different sites. And which six were they? I have no idea. We looked at the tower located the east at 20th and 3rd. That's over a mile from our target search area that had a radius of a quarter mile. And so we sent that lat long, that elevation of RF. This is an existing tower. We sent the one located to the north. They're already on that one. The one located to the east was too far away from the search area to meet their goal. All four of the towers that are north of the golf course were checked? Yes, they're already on the one to the north. One of the couple of tall ones that are out there, they're already on that one. Okay, and why can't they put, what about, the, you're saying that the one on 3rd and 20th is not going to work? No, nope, that's over a mile to the east of our proposed site. That's a long distance in this capacity. So what do you have south? Because you don't have another tower until you get to the point area, and the point area there are two of them, one on South Reinhardt, way down, two miles, actually a little over two miles from the VFW, and then you also have the one that's on Biglin Road. Where that is probably three to four miles dis distance between the north, well, actually it's probably five or six miles between the north tower and the south tower. What's covering, what's covering that? We have an approved tower located right next to the fire department by the VFW arena. I know that, but you're not using that now, so what's providing coverage now? Right now there's a gap. When they get it on the build plan and get the budget for it, it will be built. Yeah. And that tower is about a mile from the one on Biglin Road, and it's over two and a half, two point three to two point four miles from the one on Reinhardt. And now you're saying you can't go a mile and a quarter. And actually, it's not a mile and a quarter. <clears throat> Do you have any more questions on the study, um, Mr. Neal? Like I said, we're going to have the opportunity to have the public hearing down the road too. So I mean, if you if you go through this and you have more questions, uh, I would. In yeah, I'll answer all your questions. Okay, you get your email. Okay, are you done, then, Mr. Neal? Yeah, I am. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Does anybody else have any questions? I think we've beaten this enough. I want to make sure everybody has the opportunity to talk. So. Okay. 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 Okay.
Appreciate it. An email you. I'll put a scale on it for you. No one else yeah. has anything else. We'll move on to the next item. Right. right. Appreciate everybody's time. Yeah. I guess. And Nancy, you have any right. closing? I, I do just have one quick question. Are we going to set a hearing date? Is this at a later time? Do we want to do it now? Do we want to make sure that? I mean, at some point, we're going to have to address the application itself, whether we approve or deny or um, whatever we do, we have to at least address the application. So when's the first opportunity to set it out? Are we, th are we three weeks out now, then, or are we two weeks out? Uh, so calendar? I don't, it, it would calendar? be on my phone. Oh, thanks. For yep. proper notification, I mean, are we going to be out? Oh, we'd have to be in the March sometime. Um, oh. Well, March, is March 20th. Days. Yeah. Thanks, March Ron. 20th would be <laughs> probably the soonest if you can get it. Because that would mean I would have to have the hearing notice out on Monday. Letters, so it would run on Wednesday, and I would have to have the letters done on Wednesday. It would be the same. I mean, it, it really would just be the same so public hearing, and weeks. yeah. So. Public hearing. That's what you guys want to do. That we can do that. Go for, for the 20th. Go for the 20th. Can we do the public yeah. hearing and the vote the same night? Uh, you certainly could. Depends upon what you want to do or how you want to handle it. Um, whether you're going to approve it or not, you may want to have a have somebody that uh, is a tr uh, a court reporter transcribe the meeting. If so, you're not going to have it available for for utilizing in your your decision. Uh, if it's approved. Um, you don't really run into the issue. If it's not approved, you have to have substantial evidence in the record uh, on the reasons why you disapproved it, and you've got to provide the notice of uh, of uh, to Valley and to uh, Verizon almost immediately upon uh, your decision. So, go ahead. Is the shot clock running? Uh, right now, I think we're okay because it was waived. Oh, okay. Just I raise yeah. it as a point. Yeah, it was, for, it was waived. No, for no, the we asked Verizon to waive the 60 okay. day um, to complete the study. I just want so, to make sure. Yep, yeah, no. Yep. And the review of video won't work since we have video. Review of, of the video. video? Well, you can. What I'm looking at more than anything is you, you, if you're going to need a transcript or if you need to provide that doc, the, the, the video. So we could do that if there's ever an appeal. But there's got to be a basis for a denial um, or if there's a vote in favor of it, it's basically because you're indicating that there was a denial, you know, there was a, a gap in coverage and it satisfied the requirements of our, of our code. Basically, you're upon advising how us to have the hearing, and then a week later, may have the vote. That would be my advice, yes. Okay. But two weeks later, is that's all I have. Be to the next work. Yeah. Work call that's special. Okay. Yeah, yours? Oh, yes, please. As long as we have the timelines correct. So the 20th, and then a week later will be the vote. It would be to, I would have, I would have adjourned the hearing to, yeah. to make a decision. So you'd actually have to have a, a a set a work it couldn't be a work session it would have to be a regular session where you could make a decision yeah, we were thinking about having the public hearing on the 20th council meeting and then they could adjourn or they could uh you're saying they could um adjourn resist, that resist adjourn the, the public hearing for a decision making process to whenever you could set the date but you have to have a date that you can make a decision and that could be at the 27th work session if they wanted it, to it could be if you if you uh Notice it as such. Okay. Yep. All right. Anything else, Nancy? Sorry. No, I'm. I, I just sense. wanted to make sure that sure. we had a path moving forward, so that Sounds we're good. not in limbo. So. Okay. All right. Move on to number two then. 2018 tip amendment request for transit capital project. Miss Ellis. All right. 
Thank you, President Olstead and Council Members. This should be a quick one. Uh, Earl has requested that I do a TIP amendment. We have funds set aside to purchase a, a replacement bus for dial a ride and backup for our existing regular route bus. Um, originally, the state was going to pay for it. Now, uh, our federal grant dollars are going to pay for it instead. It's a grant's already written. We already have the funds. Um, we already have the local share budgeted in our capital improvement. So it's just requesting a change. Um, to the to the dollars. I move we approve the amendment for the bus. Yep. So and and that'll just go to the next meeting. If you're comfortable with me putting oh, it on the right. consent so agenda as the tip okay. amendment, then we're good. That's a good good motion, though, Mike. So yep. I just we just have to get your approval and. I'm trying to help you out. So. Yep. <laughs> But thank you. Yes. Alrighty. Trying to get you out of here. Okay. Yeah. That's it. That's all I have for Anybody this have one. Any questions for Nancy on that? I see none. Okay. Thank you, ma'am. Number three, rental request of VFW Arena by the EGF Arts and Crafts Council and EGF Blue Line Club. Reed. Henry, please sit down so everybody can talk, please. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, last fall we put ice in for a month in September for the Blue Line Club to rent the VFW arena uh, and at the work session that we discussed that option for the Blue Line Club uh, one of the things we talked about was going forward for this year were there any options to be able to put the ice in a month early and leave it in for the duration of the season instead of what we did this past fall of put it in for a month remove it for about a 10 day window so that we could host the arts and craft show like we always have and then reinstall the ice again for the regular ice season. Um, so following that work session, I had some discussion with the Arts and Crafts Council, asked them to, um, if there were any other venues in East Grand Forks that may be an option for them, ultimately asked them to go and research and meet with some other venues in town and see if anything met their needs. Uh, and they recently, a few weeks ago, sent a letter back uh, with some of their findings and uh, in short the findings in their letter basically stated that um, there were roadblocks at any of the other venues that they looked at. They went to Central Middle School, the high school, uh, the Heritage Center, uh, and a few of them just whether they were roadblocks because the venue wasn't big enough, it didn't have the security needs, there were concerns about managing uh, the flow of people and the equipment that the crafters bring for the weekend that would, would take place on the gym floors ultimately uh, all led to them saying that the Arts and Crafts Council saying that there wasn't a site that they felt met the needs for their event the way the VFW Arena does and they've requested again to be able to use that for the event. Um, I've had some conversation with the Blue Line Club. They felt that their month of ice uh, that they rented out uh, from us to have fall camps and activities was successful uh, and that it's something they'd like to do again. Um, and we talked through a couple of different scenarios um, with them, but ultimately in light of the request from the, the Arts and Crafts Council and the findings they had, um, the Blue Line Club you know, would be, if we had to do it for the same sort of rental rate we did this year and the same sort of activity of install ice and then remove it again, they would be willing to rent it. They would want to rent it again from us kind of under the same standard we did this last fall. So. Um, I kind of ran through that quickly, but all the information there in front of you, uh, and that would be, I guess, my first thought is to move forward with basically repeating what we did last fall for the month of September, install ice, remove it, have the arts and craft show, and then put it back in again. Was there a fee for that, taken on, taken off? There was. We charged the Blue Line Club the rental fee. Uh, the fee we charged them was $14,500. And that, that figured in the, the staff and the utilities to install the ice, run the month of camp, and then the time to take the ice out. And that was all there on the, the Blue Line Club. Anybody have any questions? Or anybody would like to address the council at this time on? Anybody? No questions? Answering yeah, mine. That is fine then, sir. Okay, thank you. Thank you. 
Uh, number four, rental request to Blue Line Arena for the AC Expo's gun show. Read. Gun show. Okay. Uh, we've got a request from a group called AC Expo's Gun Shows to rent the Blue Line Arena for a weekend in June. Um, the weekend I have in the in the packet I handed out June 1st to 3rd, I got a call from the gentleman that's that would like to organize this yesterday and he maybe wants to change his date in June, but plan the idea of a month in June. Um, the, uh, I'm sorry, a weekend in June, thank you. Uh, the general idea here is that uh, this gentleman it, uh, travels all over the state of Minnesota hosting gun shows. Uh, he brings in a trailer of equipment, tables and chairs, uh, and does all of the work to find vendors, uh, recruit vendors to set up tables um, to sell guns uh, or show off guns to the general public and the public would pay an admission fee to get into the building. Uh, he would hire and provide the security to have watch over the building for the weekend that the vendors were set up. Um, and so more than anything is just looking for a space. The city's responsibility would be uh, to have somebody on site for the duration of it to basically manage the building, clean bathrooms, empty garbage cans, answer questions for the public of general how to get around, that kind of thing. Um, but one person on site for the duration, the daily durations, uh, would be able to accomplish that work. Uh, so. I followed up, or I, I sent this the first time I got the call. I sent the request through Mr. Galstead and CNH Insurance to the League of Minnesota Cities uh, to see if they had any thoughts or concerns on the idea of hosting a gun show in one of our facilities. And um, the the general response was that no, there are communities all across the state that do it. Uh, and the biggest thing would be that we'd want to make sure we have additional insurance uh, and that the the holder of the gun show AC Expos would issue us a certificate that listed us additionally insured. So I've communicated that with him and that was something that he's used to in going to different events. So uh, I think the discussion for this group is whether or not this is something that we want to host at our venue and then if we do uh, a suggested rental rate I suggested to him um, that $300 a day would be the lowest we would go just to cover the time of staff and the work that would go into it. And it sounded like that was um, pretty consistent with what he's rented for dry floor buildings and in other communities he's been in. So, Henry. I'd like to make a comment. Uh, <clears throat> they, uh, we've got a gun dealer right downtown and uh, what you're doing here you're taking somebody from coming out of, uh, out of the area and putting on a gun show. Uh, what you're doing is making it difficult for them to develop. Now, what we've done in the past, uh, we, we let sport groups and so forth, nonprofits, this is, this is a profit deal. And I'm vehemently against it. I mean, if we're gonna rent, uh, let stuff out for every Tom, Dick, and Harry, and uh, we're going to hurt local merchants, well, then I think we're going the wrong direction. Uh, I, <clears throat> if you get Ducks Unlimited, groups like that, we do fine. Uh, if we've got to take and balance budgets by something like this from out of town, I don't care who he is or what he is, but uh, I'm not against guns. I taught guns. I, I taught more weapons than most people so uh, and everybody in my family has taken gun training and my grandchildren everybody else but it's a business decision right uh, we've got we've got a uh, gun dealer here we've got they have one across the river you've got shields uh, they, they, these people are here and uh, let's keep renting it out to nonprofits because uh, that's what I think we should do. Now, maybe the rest of you disagree, but uh, uh, I, uh, I don't think we should uh, bring people in and, and start, uh, the effect would be putting other people out of business that are local. Mr. Demers. 
Thank you, Mr. President. I guess the timing on this is <laughs> is is uh, a bit of a coincidence, I guess, with all the national media. But I guess, in my opinion, um, I think one of the biggest things as a city we need to do is be consistent with our application and use of things. Obviously, we can use um, judgment that will allow some variation to that consistency. But I think at the at our at a principal level, we should seek consistency. And we do allow people with different hobbies, different interests, access to our buildings. And I think there's nothing outside of the, the decency or, um, you know, outside of the norm that a gun show brings that... Um, you know, if it was a hate group rally or something like that, I could see making an argument for, against that. Now, like I said, we have craft shows, we have, you know, ice show or ice shows, we have, you know, ice training. We, we do a lot of different things in there. We're hopefully going to do some health stuff that we're allowing, you know, nonprofit or, well, I guess all true is nonprofit, oh. but I mean, people that to expand their business in our facilities. So I think I don't have a problem with the gun show per se, and that's not to say that I don't think there's a difference between a gun and a crafted doily, <laughs> but um, but I think we need to be consistent with how we allow use to our facilities. That being said, I the problem I have with gun shows isn't their access, it's that we allow unlicensed sellers to sell and I would be full in favor with this if we re require any dealer to be licensed and the reason for it is because if you're licensed you have to do background checks you have to do all the stuff that's required to do to transfer uh, a firearm and like I said I we live in northwestern Minnesota I have I don't personally use firearms because it's just not how I was brought up. But I'm around them enough. I mean, Clarence, you you train people, you know, for in school and stuff. I'm all for it. I think they're the idea that we it's either all or nothing is is ridiculous. But there are simple things that we can do, simple steps that we can do that will re, will make it safer. It's never going to be perfectly safe. It's never going to be, you know. 100% uh, zero leakage for for these type of things and there's hope you know who knows if someone makes a back deal and says well I'm not actually selling here but here's my card do it online I'm not saying that this is going to get around it but that would be my requirement is that it is for licensed dealers and licensed dealers only so that would and and then what we charge the group that does the hockey camp, what do we charge them? The the Blue Line Club? Well, it's not the Blue... It's the the guys that come in. It's not the Blue Line Club that does it, do, do they? Yeah, the summer hockey camp and the... I thought we had a couple guys that came in and did one outside of that. The, the, summer, the summer camp in June, the Blue Line Club organizes it. They hire coaches, okay. but they, yeah. they hire and pay those coaches. So... But that it's that hard. Has ice and all that, but it's hard to equate that because it's ice. So in the summer, their rate, the last few years has been nine thousand dollars for the month, and then again that month of September this past year was fourteen thousand five hundred. Um, you know, the rate that we have charged the last number of years to the Arts and Crafts Council for their three-day event has been two hundred dollars a day for each of the Civic Center and the VFW Arena, and again kind of going back to the meeting we had a few weeks ago regarding the Ann Carlson Center use, one of the things that we discussed at the council meeting was even reviewing those rates and whether or not that's, is that still a, a rate that covers the cost of the staff? They, a little bit of the work that I put into this in, in talking about a $300 a day rate, I figured for a staff person to be in the building, a part-time staff person to be in the building for the times that they needed, it's going to cost us about $700 to $750. Right, so and that's, and that that's is where I came up with $300 a day. Time, but yeah. we're subsidizing the 
yeah the structure i mean yeah. there's there's nothing without like having a city. big mm -hmm. building there so it goes beyond just you know yeah. that's what the staff is doing so and that's I right guess that's what i'm trying to get at is obviously we want to cover our costs to make it yeah not a loss but when we factor that in we have to f think right hey we're subsidizing these to the tune of a couple hundred thousand dollars or a quarter million a piece or whatever it ends up being so yes it doesn't cost us to have an extra person there but we got to keep the lights on we got to maintain it we got to make sure that it's still standing so i would Agreed. suggest is the oh, and is there a entry fee i'm assuming for yeah. this yeah. 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 how much five five dollars oh that's it okay i guess i would i would take a little bit different approach to the to the fee and I don't have a number. I'll, I'll admit yeah. I don't have one right now, but I would say it's it should be considerably more. Okay. And actually, I'm going to say is I think you've got a fee schedule that you that you've already approved or has been approved, so you're going to probably want to either modify that or revisit how you're how you're. Um, I, yeah, and if, the if there rate. is a fee schedule that's been approved, I I don't know of it. I'm not sure. Uh, I know we. Um, We've approved one in the past that specifically had rental rates on it for. Um, ice rentals. And yeah, and that's okay. the only. The, so, to your point, Mr. Galstead, about the fee schedule, the only fee, building rental fee that I've known of has been the $200 a day rate for dry floor events. Um, which uh, that's again i think one that with I, I don't know how many years ago it was that that was agreed to but i think that that even could be revisited oh i think you can revisit anything it's just Denver, a matter so. of going ahead and and setting your policy and yeah doing it. yeah um and I, I would agree too mr demers with some of your thoughts on on the rental rates um and a part of that is the reason I brought it forward here today to get even an opinion on what what is a number that if we're going to raise it to you know what is reasonable to still make events if uh, if it's a rental is that a goal of ours is to rent the buildings out more for dry events and then what is a reasonable rate for that that it's still attractive to rent it but enough that we're happy covering not only our costs but maybe making a little bit on it at the same time um, i haven't been able to gain a formula from other colleagues or communities i've talked to in how we charge what what are the utilities for the day when we just have the lights on and we need to clean the bathrooms or we have the bathroom water running to wash hands you know um and really the response i've had from talking to a few other communities some have rates set that it's very simply uh 300 a day for no matter what the event is others take it on a case-by-case -case basis the grand forks park district when they dry, rent out their dry floor events it's well, it depends on what you need from us and how much time you need it for and how many employees are going to be there and it it really has been case by case so i would be open to any suggestion on that um and certainly if if it is can be brought forward in the future to set a better policy for it i'd be all, all for it as well so just to clear up mm -hmm. this is a licensed person though just to make the, the, the guy doing this just so everybody knows looking for vendors that come in i know i understand but that's I'm just saying him himself yeah he is i just want to make sure and i i can f there. certainly follow up with him and get a, a i'm sure we can request a lot more information from him on how his vendors are signed up for if they're licensed where they're licensed and um, maybe chief edland you could help out with i don't know if you if that's your area or not but to help out with what's required um i'm not an expert yet i know there's pending legislation in the Minnesota House in the near future mm -hmm. that they're looking at requiring uh, actual licenses for, for any vendor at a gun show. There would have to be you know, transfer permits and things done, but that isn't a requirement at this point in time. Okay. But I don't know all the details, but I know it's legally it's not required at this time. But it's our facility, so we get to yes, set the yeah, rules, right? Mm -hmm. That's right. Exactly. Requirements you want, but it's, as far as state statute goes, it's not right. Mr. Grassle. I, I, I would agree with. Um, over here, Mr. Demers. It's been a long day. <laughs> What's his name? <laughs> Mr. Demers. Mr. Demers. How could I forget? Um, uh, and about the license piece, and then also offering. Ask him if he's going to offer 
a spot to the vendors that we have in town. Sure. I would assume if we're going to try to have a, a a gun show that he's going to try to draw as many people and using those people in town and across the river would probably be a smart thing for him to do. That might be the only way I might go for it. Mr. Podjaminski. Thank you. Um, my my policy on our facilities is we are open for business and we don't protect businesses and if it's, this is something that can attract people and um, public would enjoy, I'm all for it. I would I agree with Mr. Demers and Mr. Grassel about the concerns about because it is guns and firearms that um, that we want to make sure that we're dealing with reputable people that he is licensed. I would ask that we follow up and do check check some references to make sure that um, this this individual's got a track record of being a stand up person and that his that his events are um, safe and and all of the other things that that they should be and I would also encourage you to work with uh, the chief and the police department because that is their their job is public safety and and um, but but if if all of those things are are get are okay then the, and and of course the getting a fair fair rent for the the facility three hundred dollars is not enough it, I just don't think it is and um, especially since we're going to staff it but but with all that being said uh, if someone wants to have an event in East Grand Forks that uh, that people enjoy and commerce takes place I'm all for it. Mr. Refill, did you have something? I, I agreed with Mr. Grassle and Mr. Demers. Mr. Pokovinsky puts a valid point there, too. There's going to be some administrative costs to this whole thing if we're going to have you checking, the chief checking. We've got our city attorney drawing up an agreement on this that those should be passed on also. And I don't think 300 is enough either. Henry. Did you uh, ever talk to the local gun dealer about this? No, I haven't. Well, as a courtesy, I think you should. I mean, uh, uh, Shields and those people are big enough to, he could take care of himself, but uh, this gun dealer, he's also in Grand Forks where he used to be the food operation. I think that's just a courtesy. But we normally let nonprofits, that's what I'm getting at. There's a lot of difference. Mr. Vetter. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. My experience with gun shows is it draws a lot of people yeah. into your town, and they come from a long distance away just to go to gun shows. So yeah. I'm all for bringing people to our town to support our other businesses. They're going to shop uh, more than likely because of the type of people that you're bringing in. They're going to go to Cabela's. They're going to go to Two Brothers Firearms and look them over while they're here anyway. They're going to go to our restaurants and, and shop. So uh, I'm all for the for it, and let's run it to them, and let's bring the people to town. Anybody else have any questions or comments? Um, with some of the follow-up that needs to be done, questions on licensing, would you like to <coughs> see me bring this back to a work session in two weeks <coughs> with the, all those answers before it is moved forward for agreement? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, sir. Can I have a quick question, uh, Mr. Galstead? So say we draft a, an agreement that says all vendors selling firearms at this, I'm not saying that this is the agreement where we're coming to us, but say we say all vendors must be licensed. And then for some reason we find out that there, there aren't or someone is selling that isn't licensed. But wouldn't you say licensed? You have to be a licensed vendor in order to sell firearms normally, right? That's what the whole gun show loophole is, right? Is that if you sell firearms, you have to be licensed, which means you have to do background checks. You have to, you know, Cabela's is a licensed vendor, right? So if we find out that they're not, is the only repercussion that we sue them for breach of contract or something? or? 
Well, if they're breaking the law, then you can. Yeah, but there's no law. What's the law? Well, if you're saying that they, if, if we're, we're not passing an ordinance, is what I'm saying, unless we pass an ordinance. If you're going to require everyone at the gun, every dealer at the gun show to have a federal firearms license, the the guy putting on the show is going to say, "See, I'm going to go to Crookston, or I'm going to go to Thief River Falls and have the gun show. I'm not going to come to your city then." I'm fine with that. I was going to make that same comment. I would be quite positive that yeah. they will not be able to host a profitable gun show if you require every vendor to have an FFL. Because then they're a dealer, and the people that are going to be dealers are the ones that are going to have their own shop sitting downtown or in no, Cabela's. No, because they're the people that are selling that don't <laughs> want to do background checks. And i that's the problem I have. I don't want people subverting the, the rules. You're not getting a person that is going to be a school shooter going to a gun show and buying a gun. I don't think so. Are you going to guarantee that? No. I'm okay. <laughs> so, I don't believe it. I not. mean, they come from all over. And I'm not saying it's, I'm not, I mean, if we want to talk, I mean, the gun debate, it's not, I'm not as worried. The stuff that makes the papers is the school shooting stuff, but there's a lot of guns out there in people's hands that shouldn't be in their hands because they aren't, because there's a whole black market out there. And I guess my, my point is, if you want to do it, do the background checks, do all that stuff. I'm fine with it, but when you deliberately try to get around that by subverting the system, I have a problem with it. So that's I've said what my requirement is, but and I I welcome them too. I think that's a great thing. I I hope that they come and do what they need to do. But the idea that the reason that they wouldn't is because they don't want to do the background checks is is a problem for me. Anybody else have anything? You got what you need to get from them. You can bring it back, and we can have a discussion more on it. Yes, sir. Okay. Wonderful. Uh, move on to number five, request to purchase more for cemetery read. Thank you again. Um, so we have $25,000 budgeted for a Toro mower with a grass catcher to replace the 2006 that we currently have on site there. Um, the... 2006 that is on site at the cemetery was replaced in 1993 that when we replaced it we transferred over to the park shop and had been using at the shop to mow and use the bagger to bag the baseball fields um, last summer that 1993 caught on fire when we were mowing the fields and was totaled so uh, if we are to purchase a new one this year the 2006 will be transferred to the baseball fields to replace that 1993 um the the mower that i when we were going through the summer budgeting process i budgeted for the wrong model mower so we have twenty five thousand budgeted uh in the mower that we would like to get uh to replace it's the the exact model that's at the cemetery um the one we'd like to get is the total price for a four-wheel drive with the grass catcher select system is 29428 and 24 cents so we are short just short of five thousand dollars from what's budgeted um, but i would request that you would approve that purchase anyway and the replacement or the extra money that we would that we're short would actually be reimbursed by our insurance when we buy a replacement um, the the, to the the estimated value of the 1993 we lost in the fire was five thousand dollars and so our the we've already received a reimbursement from insurance for thirty seven hundred dollars that's five thousand minus the one thousand dollar deductible and we actually rebought that mower from the league for three hundred dollars to part out to use what parts we could get use out of on it our replacement policy is 200 percent of the value of the estimated value so when we buy a replacement for that mower which this one would be we'll receive another five thousand dollars from the league of minnesota cities insurance trust if that all if all that crazy math makes sense um twenty nine thousand and change for the mower we have $25,000 budgeted when we buy it. We'll get another $5,000 back from insurance that we could put into the cemetery fund to make up that shortfall in the budget. Again, it's my fault that we budgeted the wrong item. I don't know what model number I looked at, but I was wrong on it when, we, when I got together with Brian and started looking at the, the actual mower that we wanted. So 
that's the uh, the price that we have there is the it's not the state contract price it's the national IPA contract price the, the state contract price hasn't been finalized for 2018 yet but it's essentially the same thing and it's okay to purchase off just the one the one price quote anybody have any questions for I'm fine I see none sir thank you thank you uh, request to hire supervisor facility maintenance in the cemetery position read Thank you again. Last one. Um, we've had a chance to visit with Mr. Brian Larson about the supervisor position that we opened uh, internally a few weeks ago, um, and I'd like to see him move forward with approval from from this council um, to assume, uh, effective upon approval, assume that position of supervisor of facility maintenance in the cemetery. Does anybody have any questions for Reed? See none. Thank, Thank you, sir. Um, number seven, update on Charter Commission. Mr. Murphy. Uh, thank you. Um, I believe you have all received um, an email from me with the list of eight names that I have received of people that um, are potentially interested in serving on the Charter Commission. Um, so if anybody has any uh, concerns with those names please let me any of those names please let me know otherwise um, I'm looking for uh, the okay to contact all of these people hopefully all eight will agree to serve and then I will work with Mr. Gall said to get that before the district court for appointment thank you Mr. President um, my only concern is uh, Mr. Nett, and I think he's a stand-up guy and is doing his Best on uh, on the EDA board. I just I I said at the outset that I didn't want people from this or on this commission. Or one of my criteria is that people on this commission not be serving on another. Um, so that would be a factor for me. Um, I know I I haven't gotten all my people that I've been trying to get a hold of to you either but and I certainly commend folks that have already turned in people um, but that would just be my only um, objection and not for merit or anything or character by any means it's just I I don't believe that in this role we should have someone that is on another commission unless maybe you step in on I didn't I haven't heard anything so no. yeah so I don't believe you no So you wanted the names by last Friday. Mm -hmm. Are you not going to take any more names? Then? Well, certainly we'll take any more names. We'll take names right up to the point that we have to submit them to the district court. And, and, I, and I would also, I, I guess my question is, is the people that are on the list, have they actually been contacted and spoken to? And that's or part of we, my thing is that I we, haven't had Or did we just put names on the list and then we're going to be contacting them? Uh, as far as what I've been told, all the people have been contacted. Okay. Um, there are some that have some concern about the time commitment and those type of things that I would be going through with them once I got okay, okay with it. Okay. Through like Anybody else have anything on that? If not, thank you, sir. Entertain a motion to adjourn. Motion. Moved by Reappel. Second. Second like by Grass. All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, right. same sign. Motion is approved. Meeting is adjourned. <coughs> You guys want to take...